Hi everybody, uh, my name is Lef Anders. I'm, um, I have a small position at the business school in, in uh, Oslo and uh, I'm working full time in the research department in Norway's Bank, the Central Bank of Norway. Um, it's a real pleasure for us to be here. I have my co-author on some of the papers I'm going to present with me here today, so it's really a pleasure, pleasure for us to be here in New York and present for you. I should say the, the usual disclaimer applies. Nothing of what I say is, should be taken as the official views of, of Norway's Bank. Okay. So what is this presentation about? Well, I'm basically going to give you um, uh, a presentation about what is the basically a broader research agenda we are having now in the bank, where we try to investigate the value of news, uh, basically in its literal form, using newspaper content, for understanding economic fluctuations. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about builds on, on these three papers you see here. Uh, they are published as working papers um, at the Norwegian Bank webpage. You can find them there if you're interested to look more into the details. Okay, so what's the point of departure, departure here? Well, we want to understand economic fluctuations. And that's a rather, rather big uh, and broad question. I'm going to narrow it down a little bit later. But first, I'm just going to emphasize, and this is obviously ob uh, it's obvious, that is not only a question of academic relevance, but of course also in practice. So for as a central banker, it's easy to use the central banking motivation. So we have a formal mandate, stable inflation. And to achieve that, we basically control the key policy rate. And to do that, we need to do, understand what drives economic fluctuations. What's causing the economy to heat? And what's causing, uh, what's causing slacks? Because the medicine we're going to use, of course, depends on, on, on the causes for, for heating or slack. And of course, uh, as is well, well known, inflation targeting, which we are um, uh, doing, is essentially about predicting, right? So if we, as central bankers or the policy guys, see that the economy is heating, well, they might want to increase the interest rate today to prevent that from happening and vice versa. Okay, so this is uh, stuff we, I guess, uh, it's, it's quite well known. So how do we do that? Uh, well, these two graphs are kind of just an example of that. As the meat and bone, as uh, for an empirical uh, macroeconomist like myself, has, I guess, for decades, since the Second World War, I guess, been the national account statistics. You get those at the quarterly frequency, maybe monthly frequency here in the US. If you're a financial economist, you use officially listed uh, stock prices, uh, company char characteristics, and stuff like that, all from structured databases. And you put that typically into linear models with relatively few, few explanatory variables. So that's the way we've been doing uh, empirical economics for decades. But today, we have lots of uh, new opportunities, of course. We have uh, new technologies in terms of methods we can use, nonlinear methods are becoming more and more popular. And of course, we have new data sources, unstructured data sources like text and newspaper content. So why do we want to use text then? Well, <coughs> a number is usually considered to be a fact. But I think it's not uh, really brave claim to, to think that the media in which this fact is um, presented, discussed, and so on, also adds to the information set. Um, and the agents, and that's us, um, of course, use both the fact and the media when we form expectations. And as economists, we like to think that the expectations we have, well, they uh, give us the outcomes we observe in the, in, in the real economy. So, so that's fairly, fairly simple logic, I think. Um, but uh, up until at least quite recently, putting text into models, these models that we as macroeconomists have been, uh, been working with, has been a little bit difficult. Um, but I'm going to show you that um, at least one way of doing it. Uh, and we show that when you use newspaper content, and that is appropriate, appropriately classified using a topic model, um, it adds valuable information for understanding economic fluctuations. And in particular, I'm going to show you that it can be used to explain and track business cycle fluctuations. It can no cost the GDP growth better than the best. And I'm going to show you what the best, uh, better than the, uh, than the best is. And I'm not going to show you the last point, actually, predict intraday returns. But it's a work in progress we have with the same data set I'm going to talk about now. We also uh, show that you can predict intraday returns and actually earn some money at least before uh, substantial trading costs. Uh, Okay, so lots of text. I'm just going to start off with showing you a short preview of what, what we find. So here you see basically on the y-axis a daily, uh, daily uh, time axis. On the, on the y-axis you have a percentage growth. The black line is quarterly GDP growth, okay? And it's a step function because you only observe GDP at the quarterly frequency. So instead of just showing the scatters, I just connect them with some straight lines. So you get this step, step function. 
And then the gray uh, areas and the white areas are expansions and recessions in the Norwegian economy, okay? And then the really cool part is the red line. And what is the red line? Well, that's just the advanced weighted average of news topics. <coughs> and as you can see, this um, daily business cycle index, as we call it, or a news coincident index, really tracks GDP growth quite well. And maybe even more importantly, it really tracks the paces of the business cycle really well. So when the economy is in a recession, well, the red line tends to be below zero. And when it's above zero, well, then the economy tends to be in an expansion. And I stress that the red line is basically just a weighted, advanced weighted average of daily news topics. And I'm going to uh, uh, step back a little bit now and, and show you how kind of we got to these news topics and how we used them to get up at the graph like this. Okay. So why, uh, point of departure was why do economic activity, activity fluctuate? And that's a broad question. I'm going to narrow it uh, down somewhat. I'm going to look at it through the lens of a popular theory in macroeconomics, the news-driven business cycle view. So the key ingredient in this uh, view, in this theory, if you like, is that changes expect in expectations due to new information, news for short, that's what's driving the whole thing. So the mechanism is simple. Business cycles are generated because agents, that's us again, uh, receive signals about future economic activity and they, then they have a sig uh, signal extraction problem. This signal either is true news or it's noise or uh, to be more popular either it's true news or it's fake news. Uh, uh, and then you get a boom in the economy if the agent correctly uh, anticipates that the signal is news and the signal is news. Okay? But you get a boom and bust if the agents think that the signal is news but it was actually fake news. So just by this simple mechanism and this, show, uh, this notion of uh, changing the expectations due to news, you can generate business cycles. So this makes this theory really popular, right? It's not, it's really a dense, simple theory. You don't need like all types of shocks, monetary policy shocks, cost plus shocks, you name it, you don't need it. You have this simple stuff and you can generate business cycles. I'm not saying I believe this theory fully, but this is the lens through which we're gonna be working now. Okay. So if you want to take this to the data, you have a problem because new information is not really easily observed, right? And changes in expectations is not really easily observed. So what have people done? Well, they have used asset prices because standard finance theory says that, okay, changes in, in prices, that should be due to fundamental information and all information should be available to everybody. So you, you can find the unexpected change in asset prices. Well, that should be news, due to news. You don't know, news, you don't know what the news is about, but that should be news. But I mean, as all of you know, asset prices, that's the simple theory and it's probably not correct. So asset prices change for a lot of reasons, likely both, uh, due to both news and noise. And as economists, we like to say, know something about what is this news actually? What is, it, what is it news about? Is it news about productivity, future uh, policy, energy market stuff? That stuff? That's something we would like to know. And just looking at the unexpected change in the asset price, doesn't really convey that. Okay, so what is our solution to this then? Well, we're going to use a business newspaper, a primary source for news. That's what we're going to use. And this is a Norwegian business newspaper, so you won't understand the, the, the language of this, of this thing. It, it's pink, so that's, uh, you can see that it's a business newspaper, I guess. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is the biggest business newspaper in Norway, okay? Uh, it's the fourth uh, largest business newspaper, irrespective of subject matter. Uh, it's quite old. It has a right wing uh, near neoliberal political stats. So we have this from a, a Scandinavian company, Retriever, uh, Retriever's Atex uh, database. 25 years of newspaper data, uh, lots of articles, lots of words. We call it big data. It's a bus, but uh, it's unstructured, so we, that's why we call it big data. Okay, so this is our primary source. And we're going to work with a really simple hypothesis. So the more this newspaper writes about a topic, a newspaper topic, the more likely this topic reflects something of importance for the economy's uh, current and future developments. That's our working hypothesis. It might be wrong, but that's where we started off doing this work. So then we have a challenge. We need to find the topics the newspaper writes about, right? So we're going to do that in, in three steps. First, we're going to decompose the newspaper into topics using a topic model. And then we're going to make this more applicable to, for usage in the time series context by turning these topics into basically daily tone adjusted um, 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 frequency measures. 
And I'm going to show you that. And then at the third stage, we're gonna, we have our raw data and we're going to put it into economic models and answer economic questions. So that's the three-step approach. The topic model we're going to use is a uh, Latin Dirichlet allocation model. <coughs> and either you know it or you don't, I'm not going to go into the technical details. What this, what's nice with this model is that it kind of decomposes and it texts in much the same way as humans would do. So I think that we read one article and I ask you guys, what is this article about? You might say, oh, it's a little bit about monetary policy, maybe a little bit about the oil market, maybe a little bit about politics. Okay, when you say that, then these words, they are basically summarizing a broader set of words. So when you say monetary policy, you say that because the article was maybe about the Fed, inflation, interest rates, stuff like that. When you say uh, oil market, it's because it might be about Saudi Arabia, North Dakota, oil production. So basically all these categories that you summarize in two, three words, are basically distribution of words. And each article is a, is a mixture of different topics. So, that, so instead of doing this manually, the, the LDA, the topic model we use, does this uh, for us. So here I show you just one out of 80 topics we extract from this newspaper. And I show this, the, then you get the word cloud, and the bigger the word, the more important the, this given word is for this specific topic. <coughs> I'm not showing you all the words for this particular topic, but about only the most important words. So then we look at this, this, to, uh, this uh, word cloud, and instead of referring to this word cloud <coughs> as topic one or two or whatever, we just give it a name. We call it the funding topic, based on the impo most important words in this word cloud. If you want to call it something else, that's fine, but I think we can all agree more or less what this topic is essentially about. So we estimate 80 topics, we get 80 word clouds, and we subjectively classify them by a given name funding, monetary policy, whatever. So then the question becomes, does this kind of topic, the composition of the business newspaper, give a good description of the business newspaper we are working with? So to say something about that, I show you this graph. So I'm not sure how much you can see of it back there, but all the, 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 the written text there are the subjectively labeled topics. And <coughs> the connection, the lies between the, the, the different topics says something about the connections between the topics. So there's three takes takeaways from this graph. First, uh, the topics we think should be related are typically related. So in the graph, you'll find a topic for, for, for example, fiscal policy, and you'll find a thick line between that topic and a topic we call taxation. And that's quite natural, right? So, so fiscal policy and taxation, well, they belong together, and we find that they share many important words. So that is given from, uh, to us from the algorithm. The second thing you might see from this is that you have many topics that you won't expect to have much to do about economics. You find topics about food, art, wine, stuff like that. Mm. Well, that's probably not that important for the economy. But it's a good description of the, uh, this business newspaper because if you're a frequent reader of this business newspaper, you know they write about stuff like that as well. They write about wine, they write about restaurants and stuff like that. And we catch this when we do this topic decomposition of the newspaper. But the most important thing I want you to um, take away from this graph is that this is the topic decomposition of a Norwegian business newspaper. You find uh, topics related to Norway's most important export articles, oil, fish, shipping. Uh, you find topics related to um, monetary policy, to fiscal policy. So it's quite, uh, and you find topics related to Norway's most important trading partners, Sweden and EU and so on. And that's the important thing for us. Okay, so then we have these topics and we have the topic, uh, this, the, the, the distribution for each, word distribution for each topic and we have all the different topics. And then we need to transform them into kind of time series to be able to use them in a, to answer economic questions. The way we do that, we basically decompose, we, we, um, <coughs> we, 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 we um, um, uh, take all the articles at uh, any given day and collapse that to one document. And then we just calculate the frequency at which they write about the specific topic at each specific day. So here I just uh, show two examples, one the policy topic and the starter topic. And the gray bars you see in the background there, that's the frequency at which they write about this specific topic at the daily frequency across time here. Okay, and then we do something more, we, adjust, we find the tone. So if they, if they write about, uh, let's say, monetary policy in a positive tone or negative tone. And we do that by just doing simple word counts. We find the most important articles for a specific day associated with monetary policy. And we, find, we, look, uh, we do word counts, positive versus negative uh, words, 
for that article, and we score the frequency associated uh, or accordingly. So either positive or negative. And then we normalize the resulting series, and then we end up with the blue stuff, which is kind of our raw data. After doing the top extraction and doing some adjustment, we get the raw data. We have 80 blue lines like this, which we're going to use to answer economic questions. Okay, and then I should say we, the, 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 in terms of scoring, in terms of tone, we just did something really simple. We did a dictionary and word count approach. It worked, so we haven't fixed it, but uh, surely you can do something much more sophisticated and probably better in this, in this respect. But we haven't tried that yet. Okay, so we have all these topics. Uh, of course, some of the topics might not be really informative in, uh, in terms of economic uh, content. For example, art, wine, food, and stuff like that. So to disentangle what's news and what's noise, we run predictive experiments, basically figuring out which news topics add marginal predictive power for a bunch of macro uh, aggregates and stock returns. And we basically define news as those news topics that add marginal predictive power above a given threshold, basically being significant or not. And if you do that, we get, get the graph like this. So here you have Y is GDP, C is consumption, CFP is productivity, uh, U sub X, that's the stock return, I is the investment, and BCI is business confidence, um, um, a business confidence survey. And then you have the topics on the left and the right, or those topics that add marginal predictive power above a threshold. And the thicker the line between the topic <coughs> and the outcome variable, well, the better that topic is at predicting this given variable. So there's two takeaways from this graph. First is that many topics seem to be able to predict various macroeconomic and financial aggregates. But the most important uh, takeaway, I think, is that actually many topics also add marginal predictive power for stock returns. And well, that's quite interesting, I think, given what we know from the financial literature. So we have OCDEX is uh, uh, third to last there. And many topics actually have a connection to this, uh, meaning that they add marginal predictive power in terms of predicting the stock, uh, stock market in Norway. Okay, so then we have our raw data. And we've kind of done some filtering, trying to define what's, what's the news in this topic uh, among all these 80 topics, and what's not so important. Then we can start uh, answering some economic questions. So um, we started off, our main motivation why, was why do economic activity fluctuate? And we wanted to answer this question by looking at the, the news doing business cycle view, where changes, changes in expectations due to news are the key component. So to address this, we basically construct the weighted average of those news topics that add marginal predictive power. And then we have a new <coughs> aggregate news index, which is a weighted average of the individual topics that are important in terms of prediction. <coughs> and then we look at this, this aggregate news index, and we look at unexpected changes to this news index, and take that as news shocks, or basically new information that you became aware of on, on any given point in time. And when we have this, we can do counterfactual experiments like, like I show you here. So what, what you see here is basically an experiment where we assume that the whole economy is in steady state. Basically everything is normal, nothing <coughs> is happening. And that steady state is normalized to zero. And then we do this thought experiment. What if an unexpected new shock happens? What happens then to productivity, consumption, inflation, and the interest rate? So these are then input responses. And as you see after this new shock, <coughs> In, uh, productivity increases, and it increases permanently. It stays elevated up until 40 quarters ahead. Consumption increases immediately and stay, is, uh, stays elevated uh, for at least 40 quarters. Inflation drops, and the interest rate uh, increases only temporarily. And these input responses are exactly those you would get from the theory model. The new student business cycle view has some, some predictions, uh, theoretical predictions. And we are able to replicate those by using the news index and the data we have. Uh, and that's quite cool. I should say if you had used unexpected change in stock prices, <coughs> this picture would not be the same. So you would not be able to, to replicate kind of the, the theory predictions. And the reason being, of course, that uh, or our take on it is basically that as this change in the asset price is both news and noise. But here we've been able to kind of filter out the use of primary source for news filter out the noise and put it into this, this framework and get kind of good, good uh, impulse responses. Okay, 
But we didn't do more because this this weighted average of, uh, of uh, which we use to kind of shock to, to to get the news shock basically consists of a weighted average of different news topics. So we can basically compute how much each individual news topic contributes to the news shock across the sample we're looking at. And when we do that, we see one topic being important in particular, and that's the topic on the upper right corner, basically contributing, it's a funding topic, basically contributing 25% uh, of the total <coughs> of this new shock. And then you have some other, the 10 other most important topics, contributing from roughly 5% and below to the total. And some of these topics are a little bit, you know, I uh, shouldn't say spurious, but uh, we have a topic we were not able to give a good label, the unknown topic, that's not too fun. <laughs> but we have, so, but most of the other topics there make sense, given that we have a Norwegian economy here, right? We have oil production, the oil price, we have a topic called results, which is basically related to statistical releases and such. You have IT and startups, you have monetary policy, and that's good for the central bank maybe. <coughs> uh, and you have a topic associated with the stock market. So most of these things, I think, make sense, but by far the most important topic is the funding topic, contributing 25% to this new shock. So basically we can say something about what, the, what is the news about, what is the new shock about, and you can't do that if you don't use, use, uh, use stock prices. Okay, but this was a little bit theoretically, right? But we have shown that, but, uh, that if you use what the newspaper writes about, well, you can add marginal predictive power for a range of economic aggregates, including stock returns, and you can put it into a theory framework if you like to try to test that theory and we show that unexpected news innovations lead to permanent increase in productivity and consumption just as uh, theory predicts um, but, and I have to really emphasize that, but we've been so far we have been working on a quarterly aggregation level and we've done that because we want to link it to quarterly macro aggregates, productivity, consumption and such but the newspaper data is available on a daily frequency, right? so let's exploit that and that's exploited uh, by constructing a daily business cycle index. So that's important, right? Because GDP is published with a considerable lag. So the, at least in Norway, GDP for the current quarter is not known before well into the next quarter. But the policymakers and maybe, maybe many others would like to know what's the state of the economy today. And if you have daily data, like newspaper data, and if that is informative about GDP, well, we can exploit that and give you a daily estimate of GDP or the business cycle. So that's what we're, what we're going to do. We're going to use the same topics, same raw data as I just showed you, and we're going to put them into a somewhat complex, non-linear, high-dimensional, primary and factor model, which basically just takes an advanced average of the news topics. And we're going to uh, use that uh, to see if, it, if these news topics track GDP growth and if it forecasts GDP growth out of sample. So this graph you already shown and now you know uh, already uh, seen and now you know a little bit more about the background, what's going into the red line. It's basically a sophisticated average of these 80 topics that we, we, we derived earlier. And just to emphasize, it fits the Norwegian business cycle really well. It gives you a really timely, good estimates of the different phases of the business cycle. Um, and you have it on a daily frequency. You don't need to wait for the next month, for the next quarter. You can update this guy at the daily frequency if you like. Okay, but some then statisticians will say, okay, hang on, this is nice, but this is all in sample stuff, right? You just uh, fit something to in sample stuff. Yes, that's true. But uh, let's go out of sample then and do some no casting. So with this graph <coughs> is basically uh, the result of an out of sample forecasting experiment. So here we, let, we pretend that we're standing in, in the second quarter of 2004. We have all the, all the newspaper content for that quarter, but we only have GDP for the, for the first quarter of 2004, and we construct what we call a low cost for the second quarter. And then we store that forecast. And we update our information set with the second quarter GDP and the third quarter newspaper content and make a new low cost for the third quarter. And we keep on doing that for the whole evaluation sample this year on the y uh, x axis. And then we can compare that to the actual outcomes, and you get some forecast errors. And then we compare those forecast errors to SAM. So what is SAM? Well, that's the system of averaging models, which we have in the Novus Bank. It's basically 500 or so individual, simple to uh, complex time series models. We basically have a kitchen sink of hard economic variables going into each individual model. And then we make an optimal combination of those individual forecasts to give you one combined forecast. And that tends to work really well, OK? Um, and then we compare those forecasters from that system to the, to the 
to the new space portals. And then you get the black line, so forecast on the black line. So if the black line is above zero, it means that SAM is better than the new forecast, and vice versa. So you see when you have a short evaluation sample in the beginning, well, the SAM system tends to be a little bit better. But then when we go into the financial crisis, the business cycle turns, the new space model really improves relative to SAM. And I think around 2009, the, the, the new space forecasts are roughly 15% better than the SAM system. And then 2011 was a bad year for news in Norway, at least in terms of forecasting GDP, so we lose ground. But on average across the whole sample, the new space model is, is, is marginally better than SAM. And I think that's quite impressive, given that you know in the SAM system you have 500 individual models, just hard economic indicators. You have bars, primary bars, factory models, you name it, we have it. Um, and then you compare that to the simple, or relatively complex, but this one single new space model, and, and you, you see that you can actually do better uh, in terms of forecasting the, 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 the current GDP with the, with, the, with the news data. So that's quite encouraging. The last result I want to show you says something about official inefficiency. So you know that GDP numbers, they are heavily revised, and especially so in Norway. So when the statistical agent released GDP, you know they do that many times, and then the <coughs> the same quarter will be revised, subsequently revised. And that's perfectly fine if they get new information after the fact. If they get new information after their first release, well, they want to revise that initial release because they got new information. But if you can predict uh, better than the statistical agency what the final release would be using the information you had available when they did their first release well that means that they do a jo bad job right they you, they don't utilize all the information they could have had they used when they give their first release and this is what this uh, table shows so we're basically saying that if the statistical agency had used the new space forecast <coughs> before they released the first release of GDP and adjusted the, and have used that forecast and adjusted their, their first release accordingly, well, their revisions would have been smaller. So the takeaway from that is basically that news reduces noise. And it's really a uh, really significant this coefficient. So that leaves us with a conclusion, I think. Um, a number that's uh, usually taken to be a fact, but the media in which this number of fact is presented, discussed, or opinionate, opinionated, adds to the information. When we show that the new newspaper content is appropriately classified using a topic model, it seems to add valuable information um, for understanding economic fluctuations. And in particular, our results suggest that news can be used to explain business cycle fluctuations, uh, no cost, GDP growth quite well, and reduce noise. Thank you. <coughs>